The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional legal advice, medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your attorney, advocate, physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding any medical or educational concerns. Hello and welcome to Empower Dyslexia. I'm your host, Stephen Yearout, and on this show, we're here to help you become a better partner in education. Uh, on this show, we discuss dyslexia and other related disorders, research, interventions, special education policy at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, we also interview experts in the field and people with personal uh, experiences and stories, which is my favorite. Uh, topic to talk to uh, people that are actually dealing with um, learning disabilities. Please be sure to subscribe to us on Facebook, uh, leave us a comment, make sure that uh, we understand that, you know, exactly what it is that you're needing, the information that you're needing, so we can uh, plan our topics. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe and like us on YouTube. And if you like to watch Empower Dyslexia, Obviously, you're going to watch it on uh, Facebook Live or YouTube Live. If you like to listen to the podcast audio version, you can get it on all of your favorite audio apps. iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Pop Podcasts, uh, Alexa. Um, the new one that is, is, should be up within the next uh, couple weeks is Pandora. So we're actually on Pandora now, which is... Uh, Great news. I mean, we're moving on, moving on up. <laughs> so uh, today's topic is about self-advocacy and answering the five W's in 1H. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, I have a special guest today. She has been an educator for 30 years. Uh, she began her career as a special education uh, teacher working with students that have learning disabilities and behavioral difficulties. Uh, she did that for seven years, but spent the majority of her time uh, as a gen ed elementary school teacher. Uh, and for the last two years, she now has trans, uh, transferred to or transitioned actually into uh, being a dyslexia therapist. So I would like uh, to welcome Miss Christy Elms. Thanks. Welcome to our show. Thanks. So um, could you start by telling our audience a little bit about yourself and your journey? Uh, yeah, I wanted to be a teacher probably from a very young age. Um, I was an elementary school child back in the 70s when they were just first starting to identify and recognize special education. And um, I think I, I think I might have had a touch of the a little bit of ADD, ADHD. I was sort of busy all the time. And I think because I um, was you know, so busy, they put me in a special education classroom and my mom fought and fought and fought that because I could read, I could read fine. And so, you know, we, once I got into intermediate, it was fine and reading was always my strongest subject, but I always was very interested in special education because of that personal experience that I had. So when I went to college, I decided to major in special education and I was specifically interested in learning disabilities and, and um, behavioral disorders. And so I did that for a little bit in the public school system and then I got the opportunity to transition into the classroom, which, uh, which was really a great thing because more and more these children were becoming, you know, those, uh, those self-contained classrooms were becoming less and less. And I was able to use those skills that I had as a special education teacher to help kids um, sort of succeed and, and, and broaden their horizons in the gen ed classroom so they didn't have to be removed as much. So I started that and I did that for a very long time, um, loved every minute of it, worked with a lot of different kids and then... You won Teacher of the Year, didn't you? Yes, I won, Yes, I was Teacher of the Year um, for Garland ISD, Elementary Teacher of the Year, so that was a great honor. It was a wonderful honor. I was very excited about that. And then um, right prior to that, though, my own child had been diagnosed with dyslexia and it was interesting with him I started to realize how little we knew about dyslexia even just five six seven years ago because um, I always knew there was something going on with him but I just hadn't even with my own training I hadn't quite 
put together that he was dyslexic. I, I think it was always in the back of my mind, but I, I was sort of still subscribing to the old school of thought where they saw things backwards. And I knew he didn't see things backwards. I just knew that he couldn't pronounce things properly or he couldn't, you know, you could, he would miscue on the same word over and over and over and over again. I couldn't understand why they were giving him these, um, these uh, word attack skill tests and he was doing terrible, but yet his comprehension was on level. I, I just didn't understand that. Nobody could explain it to me. And I think the teachers didn't even know. I mean, they didn't understand. They just thought maybe he was just an immature boy. And so he didn't get diagnosed until he was uh, almost fifth grade with dyslexia. And so it was from that time on that we had to sort of teach him to, to, to be an, his own advocate because he only had one more year left in elementary school where I could sort of, because he went to the same school that I taught at. Um, he only had one more year before I was sending him off to middle school. And I knew that I had to get him ready for that. So, um, and that therein lied, the, you know, started his journey of self-advocating and he's about to go off to college now. And I think those skills are gonna help him tremendously in that transition as we get him ready to go off next week. So what um, what was the the turning point that made you want to go from a gen ed teacher into being a dyslexia therapist? Primarily Weston, my, my, my son Weston. Um, I, and I and I not only did I want to go into dyslexia, learning how to be a dyslexia teacher, to therapist. I I wanted to do middle school in particular because I know how that impacted him, and I know the walls that we had to climb over, and I knew. Um, even even as early as last year, there was the summer even with everything with COVID being shut down and him not being able to get the certain tests he needed to get into to, to his college of choice. It was just, it's always been a battle and I wanted to help I wanted to be there for parents. That's one of the things I felt like I was strongest at as, a, as just as a gen ed teacher is just being that support system for not only kids, but for their parents. And once you have that relationship with children, it's very easy to transition to a great relationship with their parents. And I knew that with the experience that I had with Wes, that I could help them because it's very, very frustrating when you are in this business, but when you're a layperson and you don't you don't know the ins and outs of the education world. And that that is, that, that's just, the, got to be maddening. So I know how frustrated I was. I couldn't even imagine how somebody who wasn't even in the field fell. So that's, that was the other reason. That was the biggest reason I wanted to do it. Yeah. When Amy and I first met um, Christy, uh, our child was, our middle son was actually, he was just finishing up uh, his intervention through the ISD. Um, so he didn't get the opportunity to actually work with you. However, you did kind of oversee his yes. uh, mm -hmm. 504 plan uh, while he was in middle school. And it was very evident to us the uh, how much you cared for your students yeah. and how much you cared for the parents and that you were there uh, to be the, the advocate for those children when their parents weren't there. Right. And right. that, that yeah. All, you know, I was always so thankful that uh, we had that person that had our child. Right. I mean, one of the things I said in one of our meetings was, I, I, all I want to hear is, we got you. Right. Mm -hmm. We got your child. Don't worry about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I heard from you. Right. So I had no problems leaving my child. Well, and you know, the thing, you. and it's not as, I would say, I don't think it's as bad now because as, as my youngest son has trans, I have a, I have an older son that I had to deal with as well going through school, but um, it's, I don't, I feel like people have, in some cases, maybe not all, but in my personal experience, it changed a bit because I got, I sort of with my older son and somewhat with my younger son, it was always sort of this attitude. Well, you know, the, 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 the saying, it takes a village. Well, my saying is it takes a village, but I'll let you know if you can be in my village because a lot of the things that I got back from educators, administrators with regard to my, both of my children were, we got this mom, don't worry. You know, you know, we expect them to be a little bit, you know, be a little bit more mature and take care of this, that, and the other. And my response to one administrator once was he's 11, mm -hmm. he's 11, I, I, he's 11. And, uh, you know, I'm still part of this equation. So I felt that I was being pushed out. I haven't felt that as much as we've gotten more educated about learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, and in the school that I particularly teach at, I don't, I don't feel that there's that. I, I hope the parents don't feel that way. I hope my parents don't feel that way. And that's why I want my parents to know that if you're getting that, you know, somewhere else that I'm going to step in and I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you because that's okay. an important part. That's an important piece of what they need, what parents need. Parents need to feel like somebody's with them because sometimes they feel ganged up on in these situations. Right. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about the difference because we hear this a lot, modification versus accommodation. Mm -hmm. And these words get used um, in different ways, but they a lot of times they get used as the same word. Right. So, but it's, they're completely different, especially when we're talking about uh, putting them in a 504 plan or an mm -hmm. IEP. Mm -hmm. However, they're not, modification isn't going to be in a 504 plan. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's only going to be in special education, an IEP. Correct. So mm -hmm. the difference between a modification and an accommodation is going to be, um, number one, a modification is going to change grade level. Correct. So if you give a child uh, who is fifth grade homework or classwork and they're working on a third grade level or a second grade level, you're modifying the curriculum, curriculum. for that grade level Correct. Mm -hmm. for that child. Correct. Modification. Accommodation is used to level the playing field that the child can access the curriculum. Mm -hmm the same as all other students in the class. Correct. Mm -hmm. we, we agree? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we always need to make sure that we, we keep in mind, though, that when we're picking these accommodations for our children, you know, in, in the 504 plan or in a, in a ART or, or, you know, in the IEP about the accommodations that the children need, we need to make sure that we're keeping that in, in mind, that it's, it is specifically Specific for that, that child. child. Right. It's, it's not a, well, it's just a laundry list of accommodations. Right. It's not a matter of going in and just checking off every single box going, yeah, 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 yeah. What do these, what do these children specifically need to help them through the time that they're getting their remediation to be um, on a level playing field in the classroom? Uh, what, so the accommodations that I generally choose that are generally most advantageous for our dyslexic kids are oral administration. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, access to notes, that's a big one. A lot of teachers are kind of resistant to that. They, they don't mind giving their notes, but they also want the child to, to write their own notes. And so I've had to explain to teachers, you have to understand a lot of these children, my son in particular, was a very much an auditory learner. Um, he listens to a lot of auditory books, so he's very strong auditorily, and he does better listening to what you're saying and taking in what you're saying. If he is distracted with this, then it's not, it's not going to do any good for him. He's not, he's still, you know, he's, he's not going to listen. He's not going to get what you're saying. So uh, we've had that little battle before. Um, I've, I've had to describe it as... He can listen and pay Correct. attention, Correct. or he can try to take notes and Correct. maybe miss 90% of what you're yes. saying because they're trying to spell it. Because as with most dyslexic kids, Wesson is also, my son is also uh, ADHD. Right. So attention is an issue for him. And so, you know, I've had so to explain which, this. which do you want? Exactly. And that's exactly. And so, you know, and a lot of times parents don't know how to advocate for that when they're sitting in the 504 meeting because a lot of times they'll say, well, we want them to try to take their notes or take a modified type of note or I'll give them a like a closed activity and that's fine for some kids but it's certainly not fine for all and so you really do need to know your student what your student's most comfortable with i would say if they're just starting a dyslexia program which is quite the, which is the case that i see a lot in, in my position because i teach in middle school some of these kids are just now being identified i would say yeah you want to go to just let them listen Make sure they're attending. Now there's some responsibility and and um, you know uh, that they have to take with that, but it's either or. It can't be both. And it for my child it wasn't. It's especially in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You you can't have both in the beginning when you're trying to remediate a learning disability. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now I think what happens a lot of times is parents tend to think yes I want them putting out effort. I want them. But what you don't understand is the amount of effort that child's already putting into mm -hmm. just paying attention and trying to take in that information and process it. And so much of this is, is so paired with that good relationship with that teacher and that parent. That is so incredibly important. And I, you know, unfortunately, that's not always the case. I hate to say that it's not. I think it is in a lot of situations, but it's not. Because it takes that partnership of the parent and the teacher to say, hey, uh, you know, he's not attending in class. So we've, we've got a problem with the notes situation. So what can we do about that? Maybe they need to change seats. Maybe I need to ask them more direct questions during lecture that kind of thing work with the parent in that regard um, and some and sometimes that's lacking you know that that communication sometimes is lacking so 
the, a, a kind of a list of a couple more. Um, obviously, we talked about copies of teachers' notes. Copies of teachers' notes. And I would I would make sure that we we preface that with copies of teachers' notes, regardless if the child turns in any notes. Don't require them to take notes and trade you know trade notes for teacher notes. Um, note taking assistant. Yes. I. I had an issue with this particular one, especially in the younger, you know, middle school, elementary school, but because you and I can sit and listen to a lecture and get something completely different out of it, Correct. Mm -hmm. and our notes would look completely different. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking what you're hearing, not what I'm hearing. Well, the other problem with that too, especially at the middle school level, is that your dyslexic child, particularly, um, I find with boys especially, uh, when they've just been diagnosed at the middle school level, that's for what they feel that that's embarrassing to them. It and is so when somebody else is taking notes for them, they don't necessarily mm -hmm. want that, and there's a resentment that builds up with that. And, Absolutely. Uh -huh. And then then you have behavior problems. Uh, additional time on classroom assignments tests my son thinks this is his biggest thing oh, the extra time is huge for him absolutely mm -hmm. and i've had or amy and i've had to fight for this uh almost every year mm -hmm. about why do they get extra days and we always preface this by saying it's an exception not the rule it's a stop gap it's a fire fire block firewall mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it because if he misses the assignment today or doesn't finish it, tomorrow he's got more work. Mm -hmm. Next day he's got more work. Correct. And at some point it get, becomes too much and they just give up. Correct, yes. So we've always had three extra days mm -hmm. and we're gonna try to use this as uh, sparingly as possible. Correct, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't allow our, our children to um, use that as well we have three days to turn it in we're not going to do it today mm -hmm. if you have time to do it today you're going to do it today right I, that's the same yeah we are the same at our house as well um, and this one gets people tricked up a lot of times shorting uh, shortening or reducing the um, assignments yeah test choices um, where if it's multiple choice maybe you go to two choices not mm -hmm. four Mm -hmm. That's not modifying the work. Right. That is um, modifying it, again, would be mm -hmm. changing grade levels. This is allowing them to access the, the curriculum at the same mm -hmm. as everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, alternative test locations that provide quiet. Right. That's pretty huge. Mm -hmm. That's, that is huge. Um, and I know a lot of times uh, now, especially now, um, our districts are using a recorded test mm -hmm. and giving them their Chromebook and telling them to stay there in the classroom as, as uh, yeah. listening with their headphones. That works for some kids, but you really need to know, like you said, you need to know your child. Yeah. Does your child have ADHD? Are they able to control that ADHD during classroom, during mm -hmm. tests, mm -hmm. those type of things. Um, and one of the biggest ones, especially for our dyslex dyslexic children, oral administration. Oral administration is huge, and I cannot tell you how many times I've had to sit with my students and ask them specifically, are you getting your oral administration? Are you getting your oral administration? Some of them will say no, some of them will say yes, some of them will say no, but they, for, they neglect to tell me that they've refused it. Right. And so, um, so as their teacher, as their, you know, I, I call myself school mom, I'm your school mom, you know, because, and I, we sit down and we conference a lot and I say to them, these are your accommodations that you are, that you are required to have by law. This is not optional. This is not an optional thing. And so, um, you know, but I also preface that by saying your teachers have a lot of kids, especially at the middle school and high school level. They have a lot of kids filtering through their room all day. They have a lot of things going on at one time. I mean, they are literally walking and chewing gum, 10 flavors of gum at the same time in, in each individual classroom. So it's incumbent upon you to remind them, this is what I need. Because they may just, they may forget, not out of being rude or not out of being mean or not feeling like, you know, the kid deserves it. Just they're just busy, frantic trying to get everything settled. I said, so you need to make sure you're advocating for that. 
And, um, and then what I tell them, as I say, you politely say, for example, our MAP tests that we have to take, um, those, a lot of educational decisions are made based on those MAP tests, and they're very important. So I try to stress that with them. I try to, you know, we, we set goals for what our, our, our MOI and EO, they, they start at the beginning of the year, they take the test, and we have to, we, our look is to see if they're going up at the middle of the year and at the end of the year. And I try to set goals for them and rewards that they can, that they can earn. And what I say to them is if you are sitting down at your computer and you're not getting the oral administration, you need to alert your teacher. I've had kids from, tell me, well, they just told me they didn't know how to, because I think the, the, the link is embedded to get in, into the program to get those particular kids their oral admin. Correct. But if the teacher doesn't know how to, to access the link or to get the link going, then the kids won't have it. And sometimes the teachers have said, well, just go ahead and take it anyway. So what I've told my kids is just politely say, Mrs. Elms has told me I'm not allowed to take this without my accommodations, and here's her number, and you can call her, because I give them a piece of paper with their accommodations, with my, my personal number, my cell phone number, and my room number for the phone, and they, call, and they can call me. And that's how I sort of give them permission to sort of not necessarily, you know, I guess refuse to take a test without their comp. Yes, it's refusing to take your test without your accommodations. You do not take your test without your accommodations. And, I mean, one of the things that we ended up putting in our 504 plan is our children or you know both of our boys um, cannot refuse an accommodation mm -hmm. and what we were f seeing is that um, the teacher would maybe they forgot and at the last second they were like hey do you want your accommodation you know in front mm -hmm. of everybody mm -hmm. and you know they would say no right and then they would bomb the test right and then when I found out that they bombed the hat test and they didn't get the oral administration, it was, well, your son didn't want it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we've stopped all that mm -hmm. by just saying they cannot refuse an accommodation. Right. There was a lot of pushback on that originally. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, because they were like, well, we can't make them. When a it. lot of times when I'm in a 504, they'll, they'll put in there um, if the child wants it. And so parents, you really need to sit down with your child before a 504 meeting and discuss this because children come into these 504 meetings and they'll say, I don't want this accommodation or I don't want that accommodation. And so a lot of times what they'll put in there is, um, you know, they can take it if they want it or if not. So you as a parent really need to have a make sure you have a role in that and decide if this is what you want for your child. And if it's not, if it, for our child, it was not an option when he was in middle school. There was a time that we did take the oral admin away for other reasons, a different, whole different story. <laughs> one of those hills I had to climb, one of those walls I had to break down. But um, but we were definitely part of that conversation, definitely part of that conversation. So, you know, a lot of times these parents just kind of walk into 504 meetings not really knowing what to expect. It's not really their Field. They, you know, they're just, you know, just there trying to do the best for their kids, right. sort of depending on us as the experts. And so what happens is a lot of times like a child will drive that, that decision because they'll say, I don't want that. And that's fine, but make sure you've had that conversation with your child and that you've discussed it thoroughly and that your opinions about that are weighed in on. I couldn't tell you how many times I, me personally sat mm -hmm. down thinking that, yeah, I got this, I can do this, I can take this test and no problem, da, 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 and get in the middle of it and go, Oh no. You're right. This is not going to be good. Right. And that's what ends up happening. We have to make sure that we understand where they are in their remediation. Yeah. And what they're actually capable of doing. And I do have some students who don't need oral administration uh, all uh, the time. But here's what I tell them. These are my eighth graders in particular. What I tell them is this may change for you as you get in school and you start hitting those AP classes. It happened to my, I tell them our, my experience with my own child. He did fine in middle school from eighth grade, from seventh to um, 11th grade. He did fine with, with no oral admin. He just needed his extra time. That was all he needed and help with notes. Um, but then he took those AP classes and we had an absolute crash and burn wall. Yeah, I always tell our boys, you're saying you don't need them, but what I would rather you do is keep them mm -hmm. and read along and listen, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, with oral admin, I'll, I'll, I'm going to add another little layer to it. One of my sons can do just fine with a computerized oral admin. Mm -hmm. The other one can't. Mm -hmm. He has to have human read. Yeah, Weston is the same. He doesn't particularly like the electronic voice tonalities. He doesn't particularly like that. Right. So 
you know, you can ha- you can stipulate that it needs to be mm-hmm. human red or computer the, red is fine. The other issue to that, especially when they're younger, are newly diagnosed. I would I would really stress newly diagnosed. Those oral admin tests are really important for them to get used to in case they, even if they back off of them later and then pick them back up, but there, there are some nuances to oral administration. There's some real nuances to that. And if they are not used, if you just start throwing, you know, uh, oral, oral admin to them in an AP course, this happened to my own son again, um, it doesn't necessarily work for them because they're not used to, again, the, 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 the small nuances when it comes to the oral admin. So, so you're saying that we need to teach them? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. How- Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not a matter of just uh, you know putting in the headphones, and you, you've got to really you've got to really teach them that these are important, and this, and this takes some experience. And so, again, it's very difficult at the middle school and high school level, especially when you're first being diagnosed, because they're just not used to it. So I'm going to run through a couple other um, of the accommodations that that we can use and, and that you can expect to see: word banks, speak speech. Text to speech, Text to speech. Mm-hmm. Um, electronic spellers, electronic dish- dictionaries, formula charts, which are huge. Mm-hmm. Um, adaptive learning tools and features and softwares and programs. That's kind of what we were talking about. Um, the other one is audiobooks. Oh, you know, one huge. of our sponsors is Learning Ally. So huge. And you know, our children, so especially here in Texas, if you have a 504 or a um, an IEP, you can get. Um, learning ally account for free. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, TEA all of my kids have pays them. for it. Mm-hmm. All of my kids have one. So you know that's something that is that is huge. And, and learning ally is human read yes. audio books and with expression, and they really right. enjoy it. Yes, and I tell you, it, I, I tell all of my parents. Um, Get your child on audiobooks. It is not a crutch because a lot of people think it's this this terrible crutch. And I will tell you my, from my own personal experience, Wesson was struggling so much in school, but he loved reading. That was the interesting thing about it. He loved being read too. He loved stories. Well, it's because we want the information. Yes, we're starved for yes. information. We want to learn, and we have we have the capability of learning mm-hmm. and we want to know more and more well, and more. And what I tell my, my parents is that many of our kids who are dyslexic also have auditory processing issues. You know, they don't always take in and remember the things they say that, they, never, that they heard. I've never met just a dyslexic. Exactly. And so what happened with Weston is that when he was in fourth grade, he wanted to read Hunger Games because all his friends were reading Hunger Games series, okay? But he could not do that. So I said, babe, why don't you just get on an audiobook? And from then on, he loved audiobooks and he sought them out and he would listen to them. And one of the things that we discovered as he got, you know, he went through his accommodate, he went through his remediation in fifth grade and then in sixth grade. And one of the things I realized as he was going through middle school he understands a lot of what is said to him. He took no notes in classes, but he was being very successful in school, more successful than his counterparts that were not learning disabled. And it occurred to me this because he understands and remembers every single thing because those auditory skills had been so sharpened and so heightened and, and refined through two full or two, three full solid years of only reading audiobooks. Well, it's because it's it is something that is tuned like that out of survival correct because otherwise we are going to sit there like a bump on a log Mm -hmm. and not retain anything Mm -hmm. if we have to do it through traditional methods correct so it's not a special gift it's not something that you being non-dyslexic couldn't benefit from also or or gain Mm -hmm. or gain uh, Mm -hmm. that skill however we're getting we're doing it out of necessity out of Mm-hmm. out of survival well and it, it it opens up a whole that that whole world of literature to them that would be closed Absolutely. that that door would be closed to them otherwise and that's one of the things that's that's so wonderful about the audiobook um, experience is that it does open up a whole like Weston he to this day will read audiobooks just just because he I, for I listening. love I love audiobooks yeah he literally will play on his game station and listen to a, a, an audiobook mm-hmm. I mean I finished the first book I've ever read through audiobooks mm-hmm. ever mm-hmm. and it at 45 years old yeah um, so looking at it putting your teacher hat on um, what can we do to help teachers understand 
the need of accommodations. I do think, uh, at least in my experience, and I do say that at least in my experience, the school I'm at and the district that I teach in, um, there has been so much education and so much push about why these things are important and us at working as a team. And I'm I just based on from the time that Weston was diagnosed to that he's just graduated this last year, I have seen such a change and such an openness of from gen ed teachers about okay how can I help this child and and, and and in my situation I have behavior I have a lot of behavior problems with my dyslexic kids so a lot I'm I try to work as well as I can with some of those teachers I had a teacher this last year who was really having some some dis behavior problems with one of my students and I, I said look just let let the child come down and he can do the work in my room on the other side of the room and and you know during this particular period of time and if he needs help I'll help him and so um, working as a teacher as a dyslexia teacher I try to work really strongly hand in hand with my gen ed teachers if they request it of me or if I see a problem going down with one of my kids um, and I will work with them to work out some some good accommodations and some good uh, things that we can do to help them be successful in their class and and also kind of take some of the stress and burden off of them I try to do that as as much as I can. As well as talking and educating my own child and saying, look, you are a piece of this. And I think that's the, the other piece of it. And one of the things that we said to Weston, you are a piece of this equation. It is your parent, your teacher, and you are definitely a part of this equation. And that's why self-advocacy is so important. I preach this to my kids every year, about every six weeks when we go through uh, testing. Absolutely. You are absolutely a part of this equation. Absolutely. It takes, it, you know, it's that village you were talking about. So everybody has responsibility. The, exactly. And I mean, you've heard me say this many times in 504 meetings. I want you to hold me responsible as a parent, mm -hmm. my child responsible as a uh, student, mm -hmm. and I'm going to hold you responsible as administration sure. and teachers. Is that fair? And everybody in the meeting always says, absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely. No, no question about it. So let's, um, let's bring Weston okay. in. Um, we have Weston, who actually is a returning guest. He was on a, a, a prior episode. And we're gonna to talk to Weston about self-advocacy and how he's seen a difference uh, growing up um, and going through school and now what he's seeing going into college. So uh, Weston, are you there? Hey, there thank he you for having me. Glad to see you here. And then uh, congratulations in getting into uh, Texas Tech. Thank you, it was a big fight. Trying to get in, but we got there. So, you know, your mom and I have had, um, you know, quite a long conversation about accommodations and advocacy. Um, so what do you see? What, I mean, give, give our audience kind of a, um, an overview of what you've seen growing up and, and how you've had to advocate for yourself uh, to get the accommodations that you need. So, I guess back when I went, like my mom was like talking about how like so back in elementary she always she always had to be that advocate and so then because you know we went to that we went to the same school so she always had access to the teachers and talking to them then once I went off to middle school well I don't have my mom with me so I have to talk to the teachers myself because honestly if you don't tell them they're not going to know if you because I can tell you this they're not going to go back into the system and then like check if if any student that they have is on 504. Yeah, I mean, the, the teachers are given, like, you know, a notebook that shows all of their yeah. students that have IEPs or 504 plans and in the, the list of their um, accommodations that they they are um, required to, to be given. Um, did you, when, when working with your teachers, did you have uh, struggles there? Were they... Um, you know, did they did they take your consideration in, in the way that you were asking for the accommodations um, and, and move forward and, and provide those appropriately? For the most part, like I guess towards the beginning, because during during class, I really wouldn't use my accommodations unless they came to tests. So once they kind of like figured out how like my process was and like doing my accommodations, they kind of, they knew what, what, what to ask and when to ask it. 
So if that makes sense. So did your teachers, did you have to ask for the accommodations or did your teachers just provide them? My teachers provided them. But he also, um, we, before school, you know, when he would get his list of teachers in middle school and high school, um, we made it his responsibility to go and speak to them about his accommodations. That was part of our plan on teaching him that, look, this is your responsibility. You need to tell them I'm dyslexic and I have these. And they'll go, and a lot of times they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I have, I have your name here or whatever. And then um, when we had meet the teacher night, then my husband and I would go back in and say, so has he spoken to you about being dyslexic? And they'd say, oh, yes, yes, he has. You know, So it seems like when kids go to teachers and, and say, uh, hey, this is what I need, they, they're very, very responsive to that. At least they have been in the schools that he, that he mm -hmm. went to. And there's, I think the idea that you, know, you talked about um, printing out a list of the accommodations mm -hmm. that your child gets, mm -hmm and having a discussion about yes. what they are, mm -hmm. why you get them, yes. and what they're going to do, and how they're gonna help you, when you can ask for them, mm -hmm. and how they're going to look throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Having those conversations for the child as to completely understand what those accommodations are and, and everything about them, I think also gives them the, um, confidence to be able to go ask for those yes. uh, accommodations in a, in a respectful manner. Correct. Would you agree, Weston? Yeah. Um, would you, did you ever feel ashamed um, asking for your accommodations? No. When I had a big, big problem with me, like, like the embarrassing of being a dyslexic when I was in fifth grade, but you know, with my mom and dad's help, like we quickly fixed that, like very quickly. And I would say one of the one of the ways one of the conscious choices that my husband and I made was because um, he was quite upset when he because he didn't really understand what dyslexia is. And let me tell you, uh, most kids, especially these kids in middle school, when they're identified late, I've sat in five hundred four meetings and watched eighth grade big old huge boys taller than me ball because they don't understand what this means to them. They know that they've struggled. They know they've not been successful. And now, and now you're um, putting, now, now you're telling them you have this, you have this disability and they don't really know what that means. And he went through that. And so one of the things that my husband and I decided to do was we just talked about it openly and often uh, with parents, with other parents, with our family, with our friends. Um, it was not uncommon for us to be talking about something with regard to school. And I'd say, well, you know, Weston's dyslexic, so, you know, we got to do da-da-da-da-da or whatever. And so we did this in front of him a lot because I wanted him to know that Dad and I had no problem discussing this out openly and honestly at all times. It was not going to be something we hid. We weren't going to be like, oh, you know, he's dyslexic. You know, we, we just talk about it naturally. So, um, and he even got to a point where he would just tell jokes about being dyslexic. He just, his jokes about being dyslexic are better than, <laughs> than anybody could ever make fun of him. You know, nobody could ever make fun of him because he would tell the joke first. He didn't, right. he didn't care. Yeah, so like pretty much anyone, anyone that kind of came across me that I was like good friends with, like they automatically knew. They're like, oh yeah, he's just like sick, you know? Because I would always make jokes about it, so it wasn't a big problem when I would have to go up and talk to the teacher about if I needed extra time on something. It's just... So how are you, what are you seeing now going into college? Um, the differences in, um, you know, getting your accommodations. Um, and I know that you haven't actually started college yet, mm -hmm. but you know, you've been, I've, I've been hearing stories about all the different processes that you have to go through in order to receive the accommodations and, and help that you need. So, um, what, what are you seeing as the difference between, you know, K-12, mm -hmm. um, and going into college? So with, I guess, so K through 12. They already have like a list of my accommodations and what I need. With college, I have to I have to create the list and then email them the list. But that's just not it. I have to actually go out and meet them. I have to have like a private like a private meeting. Professors. So so then it goes into an to an effect. If I don't do that, then I don't get any of my accommodations. 
So, I mean, I would, I would encourage parents, especially K through 12, mm-hmm. to practice this. Correct. Print out the accommodation list. Make sure that you go have a, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, have a meeting with the teachers, each teacher, mm-hmm. show them the list, mm-hmm. explain to them yes. what it is, why it is, who your child is, why your child needs these accommodations. They already have this list. But when they see yes. the parent and the child having that discussion with them. And that helps them to solidify in their mind who it is. Because, you know, when they get that list at the beginning of the year, it's just, just a list of names. They, again, they have 100 kids flowing through their gr- classes every day, almost 100 kids flowing through their classes every day. They have seven periods of 30 kids. So, I mean, you know, when, when a parent and a child comes up and says, these are the things I need, the teacher says, oh, okay, they put a face to that child and that parent, and it becomes, it, it just becomes a little bit more solidified in their brain. It's just, it's, it's a helpful tool for you, and it lets that teacher know, hey, I'm here with you, and we'll work together. Right. It, it, you know, we tried to give as much grace uh, when accommodations weren't met as possible. Right. Mm-hmm. But we've had those teachers where they refuse to give accommodations. Mm-hmm. Well, and then you have to handle that accordingly. Correct. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes you have to do a gentle nudge. Correct. Reminder. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I mean, there's been times where, you know, one of my boys have taken a test without their accommodations and they failed it miserably. And I went in there and demanded that they retake the test. Mm hmm with their appropriate accommodations. Yeah. I've had some pushback sometimes, but the majority of the time that just happened. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem if you forgot. Yeah. I don't have a problem if there was a mistake, as long as we can rectify it. We can come in there and say, oh, you know what? We forgot it. We got you. And nine times out of ten, it's really not a problem because at the end of the day, it's really not a choice. At the end of the day, it's really not a choice. And this, you know, and this is what I try to tell my kids is, you know, politely, respectfully approach your teachers about these things. If that's a problem, let me know, and then I will go and talk to the teachers. I've had to do that very few times, thank goodness. Um, Very few. And so that's that's the good thing about that. So, Weston, you're talking to... Uh, the third grade Weston now. Uh, what do you tell him about how to advocate for themselves? Because we have a lot of parents on here who have uh, children that are in the third grade or, or you know, younger grades uh, that their child is having uh, issues uh, self-advocating and they don't necessarily want to stand you know stand up in front of the teacher and ask for their accommodations so so you speaking to a third grade weston what do you tell him don't let the shame like affect sorry let me start with that so about yeah sorry i'm trying to think about it and i'm just my train of thought just completely just went away but don't let it affect you you know so it's, it's so dyslexia is pretty much it's a part of you now it always has been and it always will be there's nothing that's going to change it it's a part of you if you let it hold you back then you're it's it's just going to be so much more difficult for you mm-hmm. all right so i liked where you were going in the beginning don't be ashamed of uh asking for your accommodations that is not something that you need to be ashamed of because this mm-hmm. is not your fault. You know, you shouldn't be ashamed to go up there and say, hey, I need mm-hmm. uh, X, Y, Z to help me be successful. Well, and there are tools for children who are a little bit shy. Wesson is not a shy child. So, that, you know, it's nothing for him to go talk to a teacher. But I do work with kids who are quite shy, who are quite reserved, who are quite withdrawn. There's little signals. As the teacher, you can say, hey, if you maybe uh, put your pencil somewhere on your desk or maybe look up and wink at me or some little something, 
you can send those private signals and and but but again that takes communication but you can also put those in your 504 and correct. IEP yes, plans correct that mm -hmm. there are certain signals certain words certain whatever mm -hmm. that will allow the teacher to know that are discreet yes. and you know because again all of this depends on each individual child I, I mean you could have a parent watching this today says there's no way my child's going to do that I totally get that but we can figure out ways around that and I think again that's where communication is the key if you are not communicating with your educators and your educators aren't communi communicating with you and no one's communicating with the child you're on a road to disaster because even in the best situations this is a difficult road to go trust me I've, I've been down it we've uh, we've had to uh, we've had to knock down some real big brick walls with him just even this last year nobody's fault necessarily it just is what it is but it, it can be difficult and the key to that is communication Right. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And in, in doing that, you're teaching your child. Because let me tell you, when he goes to TAC next week, I have no access to him. They will not speak to me on the phone about my child, even though I'm paying the bill, because he's 18 and he's his own student up there. They will not speak to me on the phone about him unless he's present and has, and has given me permission. Right. So that's what you're facing. The minute they turn 18, you don't have to be involved in anything. You're not involved in that, that child can say no i don't want my parent in most times that's not going to happen but you can't just call up like so for weston he's got several academic counselors so because he's through he's going through student disability services and he's got his own counselor there i can't just call up his sds counselor and and ask questions he has to be part of that equation he has to be communicating so Weston, is there um, anything else that you would like to tell uh, the parents and or um, you know, students that are out there about um, just any tips or, or anything like that about self-advocating uh, and making sure that you get your accommodations uh, the way that you need them? Self-advocating is, is honestly key with moving on in, in academics. And then also learning, learning about your accommodations and then what, and then what they are. Cause you know, if you get like a certain amount of time on one test and then you don't get it, then that's a problem. So you just gotta just make sure that you just know like pretty much every little detail that's about that accommodation. And how to and use it, right? Sure that's in, that, it, that it is enforced. Yeah. Yeah. The I mean, teacher. That's our responsibility. That's our part of the responsibility that we have to take as mm -hmm. parents and students. Right. So, well, Weston, thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, taking the time. I know that you're, you're busy trying to get ready to go to, to tech. Um, congratulations again on getting into tech. I know that that was something you really wanted. Um, and that was a, that was a lifelong goal is to get it in, has been. get into tech and, and you've done it. So, Congratulations. Uh, thank you so much for, um, you know, coming on the show and, and sharing your story. Yeah, of course. Thank you for inviting me back. You know, it's always, it's always fun talking about this type of stuff and cause yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, Christy, you know, that's about all the time we have mm -hmm. today. Um, thank you so much for yeah. coming on here and, and giving us, uh, another perspective mm -hmm. of, uh, not only from a teacher's perspective, but a dyslexic therapist's uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say thank you for all the fabulous work that you do. Thank you. Um, and, and if parents have their child with you, you know, they should know that you have them and that, that if they're not there to advocate for their child. I will be. Will be. <laughs> so thank you for all you do. Yeah. Um, you, you, you make the education process such a better place. Thank you very much. Um, so please be sure to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave us a comment. Um, and at the end of our show, we always like to recommend if you think that your child is, is struggling or they may have a learning disability, please don't wait. Get them tested now. The process is a fairly easy process. Uh, knowing is half the battle. I can't stress this enough. You will be um, extremely happy and so will your child to understand what is going on and why they're struggling and what help can be provided. We have an evaluation template letter on our website, www. 
empowerdyslexia.info, you can download this, put in your information, turn this into your uh, campus counselor to get this process started. Um, this is uh, the most important thing that we need to do. Um, so real quick, Christy, last week we talked about, um, or I made an announcement that we were going to um, make a big announcement today. Well, Dr. Conway couldn't join us today. So um, I want to go ahead and make the announcement. Okay. So we are in uh, the planning stages for summer 21. Mm -hmm. So next year, next summer, mm -hmm. as long as the COVID-19 has yeah. subsided, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to do a reading dyslexia summer camp yeah. where we send these kids to a summer camp. They get to spend the time there and they get remediated while at summer camp. That's wonderful. They're going to get dyslexia intervention. They're going to get um, activities planned out by OT, PT, mm -hmm. psych. We're going to have the whole gamut there to How make exciting. sure when they come back. It's probably the first of any kind. That, yeah. I've never heard of a camp for strictly for kids with dyslexia. There have been some, mm -hmm. but what we're going to do I mean, of this is, nature. Is I mean, you're be, actually at a camp. Like actually, right? It, this is going to be so um, like a go away, sleep away. Camp. Yes, it, yeah. it, it's going to be so innovative. Right, innovative. Um, I can't wait. Yeah. It is so exciting. So uh, we're looking for sponsors now. Um, we have a camp picked out. Um, the kids are all going to get um, specific learning uh, dyslexia intervention, and it, this is going to be amazing. So yeah, stay sounds tuned. Like it. Sounds like it. Um, I can't wait. There's some other big announcements that are coming, but I will, we'll announce those later on. Um, thank you for tuning in as always and the support that you have given Empower Dyslexia every week. Uh, until next time, here's a word for our sponsors. Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empower Dyslexia podcast. At Learning Ally, we are always looking for new ways to engage readers struggling with a reading deficit like dyslexia and help them work to their potential. Visit www.learningally.org to learn about the Learning Ally audiobook solution, including which of your students are eligible for access. If you live in Texas, we have great news. The Texas Education Agency provides access to the Learning Ally audiobook solution for all K-12 public and charter school students with reading deficits. Get started today by visiting www.learningally.org Texas.